Uh, he talks a lot of PyCon and he, he does a tons of PyCon and he knows even more about PyCon than I will probably ever do. And, then, and he'll be talking about how, how nice and welcoming the PyCon community is. So please give him a warm welcome. Okay, well, uh, one of the things I'm going to be mentioning, not in any great detail, but at least in passing magic, is that uh, I'm a little older than you are. So I, I don't know about knowing more about Python than you ever will, because as, as your knowledge increases, mine will go down until eventually I'll end up drooling in my beard. I suppose I won't know anything at all about Python. And we we'll need to. So, good morning, everybody. Are you all having a good time? Have you had a good conference this year? Yeah! Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here. This is my first time at uh, PyCon Poland. Um, I've been working with Python for quite a long time. It will not, perhaps, have escaped your attention that I'm quite old. I'm probably the oldest person in the room. Um, and I therefore have quite a long program career. Sometimes uh, I have to teach classes where I was born, you know, I started programming considerably before anybody else in the room was born. Uh, and this can, this can make for a, a communications gap if you're not careful. So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> and uh, one of the nice things about having had such a long career in, in programming is that programming is a, a really enjoyable thing to do. Uh, and people with no technical uh, expertise at all ask me, you know, why, why have you spent your life programming computers. And I try to explain to them the feeling of, of joy and empowerment that it gives you uh, by explaining that effectively you can, I, the way I put it is, you can build castles in the sky. Anything you can imagine operating by whatever rules you want, you can create inside a computer. And of course now, the ability of, of computers to visualize things has meant that we've seen the rise of you know, multiplayer shoot 'em up space games like EVE Online, for example, which I don't know if you know if that's, that's Python powered. Uh, and so I've, I feel very lucky. Uh, there's, there's an old saying in England if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Uh, and I actually started my career in 1965 as a, as a trainee production engineer in a TV factory. So we started at 7.30 in the morning, 900 people, all building televisions. And uh, over the course of the first six months, one thing that became extremely obvious to me was that most people did not go to that factory every day because they really loved making televisions. So I've always felt extremely lucky that I've been able to make a living by doing something that I, that I love, that I, I really enjoy. So uh, my very first programming language was Algol 60. Um, in 1967, which is when I started programming as opposed to started working, uh, I went to work at the University of Bradford <coughs> on a, uh, an ICL 1909 computer with a floating point uh, unit and a vast total of 96 kilobytes of memory. Uh, the only peripherals were a, a teletype and uh, two paper tape punches that would punch at 110 characters a second and two paper tape readers that could read uh, at 2,000 characters a second. And so in order to write a program, you had to get it punched up on tape, then we had to run it through the computer, the output would come out, and then we had to interpret the paper tape by running it through a device called a flexor writer, which is kind of an early equivalent of the teletype. So I started out using Algol 60, 
And then um, they, in order to use some uh, old flexor writers that had seven hole tape rather than eight hole, I had to use assembly language to write a routine that allowed people to send output to seven bit tape instead of eight bit tape. And uh, I, I started to realize that, that I was connected with a magical environment. I started to realize as I got into the details of, of programming uh, how numbers could be used to represent abstract information. Uh, so yeah, I, I moved on and I started working with PL1. So by the time I went to college, uh, I actually had uh, about six years programming experience, and I was I was 23 by then. Uh, so for those of us who know maths, uh, I was born in 1950. So um, I, I was a fairly unusual programmer. Uh, sorry, a fairly unusual student. Uh, by the end of the first term, I had completed the uh, first year programming assignments in, in my programming classes. Uh, but I found that the, the mathematics was a lot harder. I really had to struggle uh, with mathematics. And in fact, in, in my first year, uh, we had both pure and applied mathematics. And I got you know, the, the best possible result in the pure mathematics. And I only just passed my applied mathematics exam. Uh, and then the second year I did uh, applied statistics and probability theory and again I got the best possible result in probability theory and I only just passed uh, my applied statistics class. So I, I went to see my math tutor about my results at the end of my second year and he said, yeah, we've just put you down as not very good with numbers. And that's actually quite a, an accurate assessment. I've never really uh, felt a huge amount of joy in, in quantitative work. I'm much more interested in the representation of, of uh, reality in, in different ways. And uh, so when I left university, uh, I actually spent uh, about a year as a, um, as a research assistant. But I kind of fell into commercial programming. And I, I wrote a lot of commercial software a lot of it in a language called BASIC Plus uh, for a, an operating system called Rustus E. Uh, one of the things I did there was I, I realized, I don't know how many people have actually used BASIC ever? Okay. Um, one of the things I realized, that the problem with, with building complex systems out of BASIC is the bloody line numbers, right? You've got to number all your lines. So if you want to use a piece of code and it's got particular line numbers in it, and you've already used those line numbers, then you can't just paste your code in because you'll, you'll lose lines of code. So I realized that effectively you could, you could think of the numbers between 1 and 32,767, which in those days was the uh, maximum possible line number. You could think of the, the line numbers as addresses in some sort of address space. And so I wrote a utility called Blink that effectively allowed you to write basic without the line numbers and then it acted as effectively as a, as a relocatable linking loader for the basic code, which meant that we could have libraries and we would just push them through Blink along with the rest of the code. And, uh, and it, it would come out as you know, a properly number. Okay, different routine. The same routine would have different line numbers in different programs, but nevertheless, we still ended up with, with good code. And so I realized quite early on in my career that the programmer convenience was a very important feature and that it was worth spending a considerable amount of time trying to organize your code so that the, uh, it was convenient for programmers to use, trying to organize methods that, that made it easier to use. So um, while I was writing that, that commercial software, that was my uh, first chance to get involved uh, with a user group. Uh, and I became involved with um, an organization called Decus UK. In actual fact, that, that slides out of order because one of the interesting things that, that happened uh, while I was at university was I, I discovered object orientation. And I don't know whether you know it, but one of the 
founding principles of object orientation, or a lot of them were um, laid out in a language called small talk, which was created by a guy called Alan Kay at, at uh, Xerox's Palo Alto uh, Research Center. So I read the, the papers on small talk that had, that had come out of Palo. Uh, and in 1975, in the final year of my, 1975-76, uh, the final year of my degree, I started to use a, a language called Simula 2. It was available on the newly installed Deck System 10 at Leeds University, where I studied. Uh, and by 1981, uh, I was actually an academic by that time. I uh, kind of jumped out of the, uh, the commercial world. And I, I became a lecturer in computer science at the University of Manchester. Uh, I managed to score a, a grant of £100,000 from the Science and Engineering Research Council. And so I think it was the third or the fourth day of the grant period, I actually flew off to the States to visit various uh, research institutions. And I visited Park uh, as part of that first research trip. And uh, I, I actually got a chance to use uh, Smalltalk on the Xerox Dolphin, which was a, a terribly interesting experience. And so in 1983, uh, along with a research student called Maria Walchko, we produced a, a UK implementation of, of Smalltalk. And uh, the more I used Smalltalk, uh, the less I like it. And I, I can't blame Smalltalk for, for my uh, departure from the academic world, but after five years as an academic, I did kind of realize that uh, it was not my preferred environment. I could kind of feel roots growing out through the bottom of my feet into the concrete floors of the building, and I realised if I if I didn't leave soon, uh, then I'd probably I'd probably stay there longer than I I really should. Uh, I had a very interesting note about a quote about academia a while ago. Somebody said to me, "Do you know why um, people are so why why there's so much backstabbing goes on?" In the academic world, does the phrase backstabbing mean anything? Yeah, you know, it's like people are trying to do each other in. And he said that the reason the academic world is so fierce is because the stakes are so small. And uh, so anyway, I, I was a little disillusioned with the, the academic environment. Uh, and not only that, uh, but I realized that small talk was not despite my enthusiasm for object-oriented programming, uh, Smalltalk was not the language I was going to use to write my object-oriented software. And so, uh, with that disillusion, uh, I kind of got a bit disappointed. I thought, well, you know, might as well give up on, on object-oriented programming until, uh, until something better comes along. And so, for 10 years, I ended up using uh, languages like Pascal and Basic Plus and all kinds of other languages. And there is somewhere, I, I'm not sure exactly where, but somewhere there is a site that allows people to list all the different programming languages they've, they've used in their career. And I've, I've not been able to find this site for the past four or five years, but uh, I did once, just out of interest, go and, go and fill out my list of languages and I discovered uh, when I did that, that Python was actually my 48th programming language. And I still only know 48 programming languages, so that's quite a recommendation for, for Python. Well, that's not strictly true. I mean, I've, I've looked at a bit of Ruby, I've looked at a bit of Scala, I've, I've looked at some languages experimentally just to discover uh, what they're about. But I think it, it says a lot about Python that you can, you can do so many things with it. So anyway, yeah, part of the, the, the wilderness years, if you want to think of it, call them that, part of the, the wilderness years were um, spent at, at Sun Microsystems. And you're probably uh, familiar with Sun Microsystems. I was actually worldwide, I was badge number uh, 1531. Uh, some, so I was very early into the into the organisation, and um, while I was working at some microsystems, I actually managed to to, to get a, a couple of trips to the states uh, for training. And one of the things that, that I noticed about about computing in the commercial world was that, that people really enjoyed this idea 
that a, a workstation could be used to, to give direct results. And so I was working with people who were doing things like computational modeling of molecular structures. Uh, and again, the, the theme came across that, that you can actually uh, represent things which you, you can imagine but not see. And you can find ways to make those real to people. Uh, and again, uh, I wasn't at all interested in the, the commercial side of things, although God knows I, I have spent quite a lot of time writing uh, commercial software. But basically, the, the 10 years from, from 1985 uh, to 1995, I wasn't feeling particularly inspired about programming. You know, I had a, a living to make, uh, and I made it. And uh, after I left Sun Microsystems in, 1990, in 1988, uh, I started a company which used to sell Sun workstations, uh, along with electronic publishing software. I was actually, for a, a significant length of time, one of the world's experts in a publishing system called FrameMaker, which nowadays is, is I think, an Adobe product. Uh, it does still exist, but whereas you know, the early desktop publishing systems on PCs were uh, enabled you to produce short documents in, in WYSIWYG systems, even back in 1986, 1987, I think, Frame Technology introduced Frame, but uh, even back in those days, uh, Frame Maker was capable of producing, well, one of the things they used it for was the, the documentation for the Boeing 747, which uh, I think if you, if you stretched it all out on a single shelf, it would go from this side of the room to that side of the room and back, you know, these, these manuals standing up there, a huge volume of, of documentation. So it's very good at uh, collating different parts of information, of cross-referencing things, uh, the kind of things that weren't actually considered in the early, what we might say, hobbyist or, or low-level uh, publishing systems. Anyway, um, in 1995, I moved to the United States of America, and, and um, one of the things that I've, I've been doing since, what, the early 90s, was teaching for a, a company called Learning Tree, and I've, I've taught various classes, most of them, strangely enough, uh, not programming classes, but as a part of their setup, I had one, you know, obviously before every class, you've got to go in and set all the computers up, this kind of stuff. Uh, and I'd noticed that uh, some of the setup for a particular course uh, was written in this Python language, so I kind of idly took a look at some sources, and I thought it was, it was interesting that even without knowing the language, you could kind of get some idea of what it was, what the program was supposed to do. And uh, that would be oh, a long time ago, back in 1995, I guess it would be Python 1.4, something like that. Certainly 1.6 didn't come out until 2000. So, for, anyway, I, I uh, went to a restaurant with my wife, and as they tend to in America, when a restaurant is busy, they, they gave me a pager, and they said, well, there'll be a 45 minute wait, and, and what the hell, I was hungry, I wasn't gonna try some, some you know, hiking off to some other restaurant when I knew I could get dinner in, in 45 minutes. So I said, well, does the pager work in the book store upstairs? And they said, yeah, so I, I went upstairs and I started to look as, is often my habit in a, in a strange place. I started to look at the computing books. And I came across a book called Learning Python by Mark Lutz and David Asher. And I opened it, and I was intrigued. So I, I bought it, and I spent three days basically doing very little else but, but trying to teach myself Python made all the classic mistakes, even though I already knew about object-oriented programming. Uh, I made all the classic mistakes, like you know, building data structures as lists and then using indexing to, to access the individual elements, rather than simply creating a class and, and using attribute names to access the elements. So, uh, after about three days, uh, I was convinced, you know, I was definitely going to use Python 
uh, as my principal programming language. Now, of course, by that time, in, in 1990, I suppose it was 95, 96, when I, when I started to, to use Python. So by that time, I already had had a considerable career in the computing industry, and I had seen technologies rise and, and become popular. And uh, so I thought, well, okay, it, it looks to me as though this Python stuff is going to be popular. So uh, why don't I adopt it wholeheartedly? And instead of just you know predicting that it's going to be popular, why don't I actually get involved with the language and um, help to make it popular? Uh, and uh, perhaps that will will do me some good. So I mean, if you want, my, my thinking it wasn't particularly. Uh, advanced, but by that time I had already decided that object-oriented programming was an extremely valuable paradigm. It was a, a powerful way to, to do programming and to make the, the concept of programming uh, understandable to people. So if, if object-oriented programming was good and Python was, was great for object-oriented programming, then obviously Python was, was going to be a successful technology. So I reasoned uh, that if it was going to be so successful, then uh, if I promoted the language, and if I invested 20 years in, in promoting the language, then eventually uh, total world domination would, would be achieved. Um, I'm not sure whether that happened or not, but some interesting things did, did happen along the way. So anyway, the, the nice part uh, about learning Python uh, was that it was a language I loved, I could write it quite well, it was clearly something that the world needs, so the only thing missing really was the bottom one there. I couldn't in those days find anyone to pay me for, for writing Python. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I had a purpose, uh, I had a vision or a mission, if you want to put it that way. And uh, so I uh, decided I would invest 20 years of my life, not just into Python, but into uh, the open source world generally, um, on the assumption that good things would happen as a result. Very naive assumption, of course, just casting my fate to the winds in that way, uh, but I, I chose to do it. So uh, you may be surprised uh, to discover, because uh, I mean PyCon is a very popular thing, this is what, the fifth PyCon problem now, the sixth, the eighth PyCon, uh, quite long in the tooth in, in PyCon terms then. But yeah, you may be surprised to realize that once upon a time, uh, there was no such thing. Uh, as PyCon. And it, it's quite interesting uh, how the conference started. And, you know, we all know now PyCon US is this uh, enormous conference. But um, again, so many things happen just as, as a result of, of accident. When I moved to the United States, because I wanted to be able to get regular teaching work from Learning Tree, I moved to a city called Reston, Virginia. I remember actually that the first time I went to Reston, it was in 1991 or 1992. Have many people been to America by any means? A few, yes, yeah, some. Okay, so you'll probably be familiar with this experience. So I, I got off the plane and I got through customs and everything, and then I got onto you know, the hotel bus to take me to the, the Hyatt Regency in Reston. And after about a 15 minute ride, it arrived at this hotel, and it's like, well, there was a hotel, and, and nothing much around it. And I thought, well, that's pretty really strange, they've got a town centre with no town. Uh, I didn't, didn't quite realise how American towns uh, grew up in those days. But anyway, um, because Reston was the major centre for Learning Tree on the East Coast, and because I wanted to be able to, to get to teaching work easily, uh, when I moved to the States, I moved to Reston, and when I discovered Python, I also discovered, uh, to my uh, intrigue, a very interesting fact, uh, that Guido van Rossum, the 
inventor of Python, worked for a company called the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, which was headquartered in Reston, Virginia. So, um, quite by accident, uh, I landed in an, an area which at the time had a very high, an area of high Pythonicity, I used to call it. You know, Guido was there, uh, Fred Drake was there, a number of other people whose, whose names I'll mention later were there. So, anyway, fast forward a few years, I'm learning Python. Uh, I have become a known character on the comp.lang.python um, news group mailing list, the, the Python list mailing list. And uh, one of the things I liked about the Python mailing list was that people were by and large pretty polite. And in those days, you know, the, the largest programming community was perhaps the Perl community. Uh, and comp.lang.perl was well known as somewhere where you know, if you asked a naive question, uh, you would be likely to be flamed in the, in the least friendly way. You know, what do you mean asking stupid questions like that, this kind of thing? And I don't really know where that came from, but I do know that uh, I didn't encounter anything much like that in Python, and so I also became one of the kind of monitors of, of community standards, if you like, and would encourage people uh, to be helpful and friendly, and you know, if you've only got bad things to, to write, then just don't bother uh, writing anything at all. So in 2000, uh, Guido left the CNRA, where, where he'd actually been doing the major developments for Python, and uh, by at that time, uh, Python 1.6 was about to come out. In fact, in the lore of Python, the 1.6 release uh, is sometimes termed the contractual obligation release uh, because a part of uh, Guido's contract with CNRI was that you know, before he left that uh, everything would be tied up. So um, if you look at uh, Python 1.6 and Python 2.0, there's actually very little difference between them. But most people don't use Python 1.6 simply because uh, 2.0 is exactly like it. So effectively, they released 1.6 for CNRI, and then they they moved on, and, and they immediately released 2.0. I think 2.0 came out three days after 1.6, something like that. But we we started to see some interesting developments in in the language. Um, a restructured virtual machine. Uh, the emergence of, of ways to support. So when Guido left CR, uh, CNRI. Uh, he went to a company called Be Open. I don't know whether any of you remember BIOS, the, the major software product. So he went there with Tim Peters and Barry Warsaw and Jeremy Hilton and Fred Drake. Uh, and collectively, they, that team was known as Python Labs. Now, ironically, bearing in its name, uh, bearing its name uh, a few months after Guido joined Be Open, certainly within a year of, of his joining Be Open, uh, it couldn't be open anymore because it went bankrupt. And so the Python world uh, went into turmoil, wondering you know, what the future of the language was going to be, what was going to happen to uh, Python Labs. And a bunch of guys uh, called Digital Creations, nowadays you may have heard of them as Zoke Corporation, they stepped in, they rented office space in McLean, McLean Virginia, and they uh, gave Python Labs a home. And I think, as far as I know, this is the only extant picture that shows all five members of Python Labs together. So the guy on the left is Fred Drake, then there's Jeremy Hilton, the guy in the middle is Tim Peters, who uh, is the guy who optimized the snot out of the Python dict and also is responsible for uh, the Python sorting algorithm, which to this day uh, is known as TimSort. And then Barry Warsaw uh, is next to Guido, though. Guido's on the far right. And uh, Barry Warsaw is principally known for his authorship of a package called Mailman, which uh, deals with about, I don't know what, somewhere between 40 and 60% of all the mailing lists on the internet. So you've got some very significant contributors there. Fred Drake, for a long time, was the only person who worked on the uh, Python documentation. And when I got the commit bit, um, 
And the only thing I've ever done with my commitment, by the way, is, is produce documentation. I documented the async chat and the async call modules. And uh, I was dis delighted to discover that in order to build the Python documentation uh, back in 1998, I had to install Perl. So Perl was actually a part of the, the Python toolchain, or at least the Python documentation toolchain, for a, a significant uh, length of time. Now, in those days, the major Python conference was the, the so-called IPC, the International uh, Python Conference. And I was originally planning to attend in 2000, uh, but unfortunately, a combination of a snowstorm and a server failure meant that I, I never got a chance to attend the conference. So it was only in 2002 that I attended the uh, International Python Conference, which was organized and run in, in McLean, Virginia. Uh, now, the way that the IPCs work, they were organized by a company called Fortech, which was a subsidiary of the CNRI, of Guido's employer. So basically, Fortech would organize the IPC more or less as a, as a favor to, uh, to Guido. Fortech made the principal portion of their income by running meetings for groups like the Internet Engineering Task Force, where people with large corporate budgets would swan in for four days and have you know, high-level meetings about the future of the Internet and then fly off again. And so, um, one of the things that I observed, I, I don't know if you were present at Naomi's presentation yesterday, but one of the things she said you should maybe do is, is look around any group and ask yourself who isn't there. And it became very apparent to me when I was at the International Python Conference that there, there were quite a number of people missing, precisely because Fortech had organized this thing basically along the standard lines of the corporate boondoggle, which was, which was what they knew how to do well. So there weren't very many young people there. God, there certainly weren't very many women. I can't remember how many women there were, but I know you could count the, them on the fingers of, of certainly two hands, if not one. Uh, there weren't many uh, colored people. There weren't many people uh, you know, who might have been maybe not quite so well dressed because they didn't have a very high income. There were a lot of people I knew who had a vibrant interest in the language on the com.lang.python group. Uh, who couldn't dream of, of going to the international Python conferences because of the travel and accommodation costs involved. So a lot of the people who had written significant pieces of, of Python code uh, couldn't get there anyway, uh, either. So the, the IPC had a, a lot missing from it, uh, as far as I was concerned. Now, about that time, uh, Python Labs had been set up in McLean by the uh, Digital Creations guys. And that was only about six miles up the road from where I live. Uh, and because I had by then published a book, uh, Python Web Programming was, was published in uh, January 2002. And because I published a book, I was kind of a known figure. So. Well, I started emailing Guido, and, and occasionally, once every couple of weeks, maybe, something like that, uh, I'd go over to the offices, and we'd have a natural, and then we'd all go out to have lunch at some Chinese restaurant. Uh, and one day, talk fell to um, what we could do to change the nature of the, the International Python Conference. In fact, at the end of the conference I attended in 2002, Guido had announced the creation of um, a conference's mailing list. Uh, now, my memory of it is that I waited two or three months and nothing happened on this list before I actually sent uh, you know, a message saying, hello, does this channel work? Isn't anybody interested in conferences? That kind of thing. Uh, I went back and looked at the archives a couple of years ago and I discovered that it was something like three days in actual fact. So clearly I was, I was quite ready to get involved in the topic of, of Python conferences. So um, Guido had this, this organization. At that point, I think the, the Python Software Authority was just turning into the, the Python Software Foundation. But anyway, 
Uh, Guido said that he would uh, have the PSF underwrite a community organized conference. Because I, I knew from my experience with DECAS and uh, from the Sun UK uh, user group, which I, I chaired for a couple of years, I knew that community organized conferences could be fun, they could be involving. They certainly wouldn't be the kind of standard corporate experience that, that Fortech had been uh, providing. So we decided that uh, it would be a good idea to try a, a community conference, which uh, we decided very quickly on, on the name PyCon. But uh, Guido, who's always had a very, uh, very careful eye for avoiding administrative responsibilities, uh, said he would only do that uh, as long as I chaired it. In other words, he, he wasn't going to get involved in chairing the conference himself. Thank you, Guido. So, like an idiot, I accepted, and uh, Guido said, well, there's this place where I go to uh, interpretive dance classes, yeah, never mind the typo, why don't you ask them if, if we can get space there? So, uh, we went to George Washington University in March of 2003, and we had a successful conference, there were about 250 people there, which is about the same size as the preceding uh, IPC, but it was a very different flavor conference. Uh, for a couple of days before the, the conference started, we had sprints. Uh, and I was going around, because in, in those days, having a, a 10 megahertz wireless network was, was quite something. Uh, and uh, the wireless infrastructure wasn't that good, but at least it was there. They had extremely good internet connectivity. So I went out and I bought some <coughs> Um, 100 megahertz hubs, little little hubs, and I would kind of sprinkle those around among the different groups. So people got, got very good bandwidth between their individual machines, as, as well as getting quite good internet bandwidth. And um, for example, uh, the PyCon 2003, the very first PyCon, was the first time that the group uh, that had put the twisted framework together ever met each other. Until then, all the work had been going on on mailing lists, uh, and none of them had ever met each other. So we enabled a, a lot of interesting and uh, active development work. There were some great tutorials, some interesting talks. Uh, the conference actually made a surplus of about 20, just over $20,000 for the Python Software Foundation, and uh, as a result of the success, I was, I was elected as a member of the Python Software Foundation. So, uh, that's the, the history of PyCon US. Um, at the end of the second conference in 2004, I suggested that I would be chairing one more conference. So, the community had better find a, a new chairperson. And uh, at the end of the conference in 2005, I said, well, I, you know, my closing address, I said, I'd, I'd like to say I'll see you all next year in PyCon. Uh, but I've got no idea at all whether there's going to be a PyCon next year because so far nobody has agreed to act as chairman. And so there was this uncomfortable period of about two months where people talked through, you know, are you going to be chairman, shall I be chairman, whatever. And then eventually Andrew Kuchling raised his head above the, uh, the barriers. Because I've always believed that it's, uh, my experience with Dicus, in fact, lead, led me to believe that it's, it's never a good idea for one organization to, to be led by the same person for too long. Because if, if you lead something for too long, then you, you lose your sense of freshness, uh, you don't listen to other people's ideas because you think you know exactly how it should be organized. And I can say, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if I had remained chairman of PyCon, it would not be the, the conference that it is now. And so I was, I was very glad that I did manage to find someone else to take over the chair. And now, of course, we have this tradition that, that PyCon US goes to a particular city for two years, and usually the same person chairs uh, both of those years. So we, we did, in fact, create um, quite a successful attempt. This is the, uh, the best guess I can, well, it's not a guess, it's the best record I've got uh, of the attendances in, in Python. And uh, some values that were part of PyCon uh, right from the start were the fact that it was open to anybody who wanted to attend. It was organized by the community. 
Uh, we tried to keep it very low cost, so that uh, the cost of attendance wasn't a barrier. Unfortunately, in the States, there isn't much you can do about the, the cost of travel. And also, the principle is everybody pays. So even as chairman, I registered for, for PyCon. And uh, even as the inventor of the language, Guido registered for PyCon. So there's this kind of value of, of equality. Um, should that slide come next or not? Let me make my mind up. Yeah, I suppose we, we, could, we could cope with it that way. Okay, so, um, why do people use Python? Well, when you actually look at the, the question on the internet, do a little bit of research, and you'll see people making uh, remarks like these. So the fact that it has a supportive and welcoming community, uh, and that it's a friendly community, and that it's an active community, are clearly important in, in getting people involved with Python. So bear in mind, um, in 2004, as Guido stepped down as chairman of the Python Software Foundation Board, I, I joined the PSF board, uh, and Guido became president for life, although again, his stipulation was he didn't mind being president of the PSF, as long as it didn't involve him actually doing anything, he was quite prepared to be a figurehead, because people would think it's kind of weird if his name wasn't on the masthead somewhere. So his presidency is a purely a titular position. So in 2008, I was actually elected as chairman of the PSF. That was interesting. Um, there's an old story about uh, a sergeant major in the army, very brusque, very uh, you know, barking type of person. And uh, the commanding officer calls him in one day and says, now look, sergeant, you know young Hoskins? Yes, sir. Cries all the time, I know him, sir. Yeah, well, all right, he's a very sensitive lad, but I've just discovered that his father's dead, and so I'd like you to break the news to him as gently as possible, please. So the sergeant gets the platoon up on parade, and he says, all right, then, everybody wants father is still alive, take one pace forward. Oskins, where the bloody hell do you think you're going? And being, becoming PSF chair was a bit like that. The board is elected by the membership, and then the, the board elects the chairman. And so I said, uh, okay then, who's going to be chairman at, at the first meeting after the election? I suddenly realized that I was at one side of the room, and everybody else was at the other side of the room looking at me. So that's how I uh, became chairman. But uh, although I had some, some plans for how the foundation could be developed, uh, I discovered that we, uh, in July, I was elected in March, and I discovered in July that we lost almost a quarter of a million dollars uh, on that year's PyCon. So I had to shelve a lot of plans uh, and basically focus on building financial stability for the foundation so that it could uh, continue to exist. So the things that I, I tried to do were things which uh, generally didn't cost a lot of money. So uh, in 2008, uh, an initiative that I tried to start up in 2006 but, but hadn't managed, finally came to fruition when we opened the Community Service Awards program. And that was an attempt to solve the problem of, of how do we actually recognize some of the terrific work uh, that is done. I mean, everybody with a python.org email address, everybody who uses uh, the Python list, they just take for granted that their email is going to be spam free and delivered in a timely fashion. And uh, there was no formal way before that to recognize the work of the guy Brad Knowles, who at that time was the, the only person working to keep the email flowing for, for python.org. And I think it's, it's very important that, that when people do good things, they should be realized. I think that's the best way to, to get them to do more good things. And then in, I think it was 2008, possibly, uh, at Guido's request, we started a list to discuss uh, diversity issues. And as chairman of the foundation, I, I joined that list. And over the next two years, I proceeded to receive an education 
in diversity issues, which wasn't always pleasant uh, and was always time consuming, but I did learn uh, a huge amount. I learned about the concept of privilege, where you know, we are born into particular situations, uh, we have particular advantages uh, that we take for granted without even thinking about them. So uh, I'm one of the most privileged people in the world as a relatively wealthy, um, mobile, middle class, white male. And not everybody has uh, the advantages that I did, but after two years, very, very hard work, lots of flaming, huge arguments on both the diversity list and the PSF members list, we finally published uh, the PSF diversity statement. Now, a lot of people feel that the PSF diversity statement is too anodyne, it's too general, it doesn't really say anything specific. But the point of that diversity statement is not to provide recipes for doing things correctly. It's to provide an indication to people outside the Python communities that they would be welcome to join them. Because I realized that, that if you don't make people feel welcome, uh, your groups will not grow. Uh, and it's interesting now that a lot of other uh, open source communities are starting to wrestle with, with problems of diversity. That they look at the 30% female speakers figure for PyCon and they wonder, you know, how we've done it. And people are still asking themselves, well, you know, how can we bootstrap this? How can we get more women to attend the conference? Well, the way I did it were, was very simple indeed. I actually um, talked to Google about their sponsorship of PyCon, I think for the either the first or the second Atlanta conference. Uh, and then I told the financial assistance team that $15,000 of that money was to be allocated purely to attending, uh, encouraging attendance from women. So we publicized the fact that we were looking for, for women attendees. And one of the nice things about PyCon, something that, that still continues to this day, in the United States is that one of the, the principles of PyCon is that um, financial assistance should be given first of all to those whose attendance at the conference will improve the conference experience for other people. And if you can't say that about diversity of attendance, uh, then you know you probably can't say it at all. So I'm very happy that, uh, that we got that going. So you might wonder, you know, well, what has this to do with, with how Python is, is winning new friends? Well, okay, I, I had my purpose. I wanted to make Python uh, one of the most popular programming languages. I had mastery of it because I'd been programming Python for you know, 10 or 15 years by then. And uh, as chairman of the PSF, I, I did have a, a certain amount of, of autonomy. Now, I am not trying to take credit for all of Python's popularity. Um, I think it's, it, it's a great language, it's got all kinds of, these are just some, some of the great features that I kind of plucked out of my ass because it's got uh, a list of greatness which is thousands of items uh, long. But uh, it is nice to work as part of a community where people give so much. Uh, and so uh, effectively, one of, the, one of the reasons why uh, Python is a great language is because we have a large and giving uh, community. But uh, being a great language alone isn't enough uh, to become popular. As you know, everybody who's looked at, for example, the Unix versus Windows debate uh, must realize that the two technically superior products do not always win out in the marketplace. So my strategy has been to try to make Python appealing to people on other levels than the technical. It succeeds on its own merits as a technical product. You don't need to sell Python as a technical language. But if you want people to use it, then I maintain you need to have a welcoming community. And the fact that our conferences are, are organized by the community 
helps to make people who join those conferences empowered to act on behalf uh, of their communities. Uh, and connection with other people is fulfilling. I'd like to bet uh, that at least 25% of these people in the room, uh, of, of the people in this room, aren't necessarily particularly social, don't necessarily feel comfortable uh, mixing with other people. Um, when I'm at PyCon, I tend to just walk up to strangers and say, hello, you know, is this your first PyCon? And obviously, uh, being so familiar with PyCon's history, uh, I, I feel relatively free to do that. But nobody today, nobody this weekend has, has come up to me and said, well, who are you then? And I, I don't imagine I'm that well known. So I would encourage you, uh, you know, if you see somebody walking around looking a little bit lost, just go up and talk to them, say, can I help you? What are you doing here? Where have you travelled from? Just, just make small talk. Uh, because it's very intimidating for an outsider to come into a group which it may not be, but it looks like a cohesive group. And in order to enlarge the Python community, we want new joiners, newcomers, uh, to feel welcome. Uh, and so that's, that's the way that you do it. Now, people get uh, a lot of kick from contributing to language. So when you ask me, why Python or how Python is, is winning new friends. I don't think it's the language itself that's doing that. Although, I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect Python language, and, uh, sorry, a perfect programming language. And Python, God knows, certainly has its warts, but it's definitely uh, good enough. But as I was saying, a good language alone uh, doesn't necessarily create a great community. So I don't myself think uh, that it's an accident that Python's popularity continues to grow in scientific circles, in engineering circles, in commercial circles. I mean, the web, Python is, is all over the web. But I don't think this, this has happened necessarily by accident. I think that the reason Python is winning new friends all the time can be found by looking in the mirror, you are the reason that Python is winning new friends. Thank you very much. And if we have time for a couple of questions, I'll be happy to take them. Are there any questions? Perfect. Hi. Uh, so I'm actually from another community, FreeBSD, and actually we are. This is an ongoing problem in FreeBSD community: how to build welcoming community. Because uh, on one hand, of course, uh, the outcome is that people are uh, happier to join if the community is welcoming. But yeah. how do you actually manage that? Because of course you can encourage people, but uh, at the end of the day, you have a bunch of uh, individuals who basically are. Uh, totally autonomous people, so uh, you cannot actually influence how they act, how they yeah. uh, respect yeah. well, people, I mean, mailing if, lists and stuff like that. I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, if, you, if you had seen me chairing the first three PyCons, you would have thought that I was a, a socially outgoing extrovert. Right? Well, that is not my natural behavior. I mean, I go to a party after two hours, you know, I've had enough, I'll, I'll disappear to my, my room or whatever. So, it's very difficult to, to you can't reach out and, and grab a community by the scruff of the neck. So the way I approach these things is, is to, to do it by example. Although it was not my natural mode of behavior, I realized that for PyCon to be a success, people had to feel welcoming and uh, welcome. So somebody had to be welcoming, and as chairman, that was me. So I made sure I was clearly visible as people arrived at the conference. I was talking to them. I was asking them questions. When I met someone, I would introduce them to the person behind them, you know, and I'd put them together so they, they became, they both had somebody to talk to. So I suppose I can sum it up best by advising you, you know, rather than to reach out and change other people's behavior, as they say in America, be the change you want to see. If you want to be part of a more friendly community,
then start being more friendly yourself and you will be surprised how quickly it catches on with the rest. Leading by example, I guess. Poor Magic, he's really keeping fit this week, isn't he? Running around the auditorium with the mic. I can't Hi. Hi, um, I have a question bit about history of Python, a bit, about, a bit more technical, because I have uh, an opportunity to clash with the very obvious split between Python 2 and Python 3 yeah. that existing right now. Uh, could I learn, how do you perceive it? What's your observation on it? I think things are going fine. Um, in point of fact, I mean, I've, I've made a lot of my, a lot of my money, uh, I've made a portion of my income over the past 10 years by uh, writing and teaching Python training materials. And I haven't written any, any Python 2 training materials uh, for the last six years. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I think it would, the, the transition was not necessarily well managed in the early days, right? It's perfectly obvious to anyone who thinks about it that a company like CCP Games, which has a code base of maybe 1.2 million lines of Python 2, uh, they're not going to undertake the engineering effort of migrating to Python 3 unless they can see a, a serious commercial benefit uh, from that result. So I think it's, we shouldn't be expecting everyone to port. So my focus has been on making sure that it's Python 3 that people get to learn first. Because if, I make to, if, if you learn Python 3, the transition to Python 2 is simplicity itself. There's, there's actually, at a beginner level, clearly, when you have to port a large program, there's a significant amount of thought uh, and work that has to be, has to be undertaken to, to port a, a program as a serious engineering effort. But as a learner, I don't think it really matters whether you learn Python 2 or Python 3. So my solution was I'll just teach everybody Python 3 and then the ones that end up having to use 2 might need to spend 2 or 3 days just reviewing the differences. So that's, and I, I personally think that, yeah, I know people worry that there are you know, libraries uh, that aren't being ported to Python 3 and this kind of stuff. Yeah. So what? I mean, you know, there are libraries that haven't been maintained since uh, since 1998, uh, and they'll just they'll just wither and die, and replacements will come along. So I'm perfectly happy with the way the migration to Python 3 is progressing. I think that's the end of my time. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody.